Today we are with John Richards. He's the founder of Startup Ignition and multiple other startups. Uh, today on how to start a business, we are going to talk about how much equity should you give to a co-founder. John Richards has invested in a lot of companies. Probably the most notable one in my mind would be Omniture that sold for almost $2 billion. So that was a nice probably payday for you mm -hmm. and a handful of others. We At one point in time, we were business partners. And then he kicked me out and said, this is right when I was at in, in college. And he says, you should go on your own and go and do stuff. He's been a great friend and mentor. And if you have the chance to meet him, I think it's awesome. So, but you probably get asked all the time, how much equity should I give to a co-founder? Well, first of all, I think you have to understand a lot of people think, oh, let's just split it evenly. Or we're all equal putting in this or that, or I have, you know, knowledge and skills, or I'm putting in some cash or whatever. But usually there's a primary, a secondary and a tertiary founder. And in the most typical situation, there's going to be a primary founder who is going to be founder CEO. And as an angel investor, as a venture investor, we want to see that person with greater than 50% to start. So Why is that? Because of control issues. This is not a democracy or to be run by committee. We want to but see... But why it. not like me and two of my friends, there's like three of us. Why not a third, a third, and a third? Third, and a third, and a third, because we don't know how you're going to break log jams. That you could do a two, three vote, but there's nobody that's got compelling ownership that can absolutely control things and be, as I was about to say, it's not something that should be run by committee or a democracy. It should be a benevolent dictatorship in a startup at the beginning so that somebody who's got the vision as the primary founder can make things happen and say the final okay. word on things. And that's just much more powerful and much more reliable to get to the finish line. And so there's it mitigates risk for the investors. Let's talk about war stories okay. without mentioning names. So <laughs> okay. that way you or I don't get in trouble breaking yeah. confidentiality rules 50-50. Yeah, so absolute worst problem in all of entrepreneurship because even the greatest attorney in the world can't fix it is 50-50 where both parties are immovable and just dig in their heels. And that can be really detrimental. And it's one of the first things I teach entrepreneurs is, you know, and that's even four people at 25% apiece. Give uh, us a story. There was a great young woman who founded a company here in Utah and first month did 40,000 revenue, really off to a great start. And uh, she had a partner and it was her vision. She was the driver, but she allowed it to be 50-50. Just a few months into it with that kind of success, usually these problems don't exacerbate it until there's success, which is ironic. If there, it's a failure, nobody cares because there's nothing to worry about or go after. So in the uh, this situation, they started disagreeing on things and the secondary founder who had 50% really dug in her heels and they just could not make decisions and move forward and hire people and do all the the things that growth requires. And so they came to loggerheads and basically decided that they couldn't work together. Well, at 50-50, it became a real messy affair. And one of them was going to follow a spouse out of state to a job. They were trying to figure things out. What happened was because they couldn't agree on what to do, they went into an attorney's office and decided to do a sort of an auction. There was a right way and a wrong way to do this to figure that out, which is the right way would be each rights a number in an envelope, seals it, and then they open the envelopes and whatever the higher price is, then that deal happens. But this time, that secondary founder wouldn't even agree to that and, uh, and said, somebody has to go first. And then they couldn't agree who was going to go first. So they literally flipped a coin. So the primary founder lost the coin toss and then had to put out the number first. The other one said, I'll take it, bought the company, and the primary founder was out of her own company. Do you have another 50-50 war story? Yeah, there's 50-50 war stories all over. There are four uh, uh, students at a university that started a company that they did great work on it in terms of startup validation work. And they all of a sudden found out that there was high demand and it was going to be a success. And then they started arguing and disagreeing. And it was 25, 25, 25, 25. And when push came to shove and they were getting lots of attention and it looked like they were going to get great investment. They just couldn't work together and basically split in two versus two. And it went really litigious and really badly for a long while. A lot of mentors and people had to get in there and at the nick of time saved it completely exploding and or imploding. And uh, they ended up hating each other, mm -hmm. the two versus two. And two guys were out and two guys went on with the company and it was just nasty. So you think the main person 
should have at least 50%. Yeah, and it's not just like 51-49. If it was two, I'd like to see 55 at least. But I think even like if you're going to have a primary and secondary, I'd like to see 65-35 just because then when you bring in a third person, like let's say a great tech person and you have to give them 10% of the company or something, or at least the first 12 to 18 months, the company will have control of the company. Okay. So hypothetically, you and I come up with an idea together. We're like, hey, this is the greatest idea ever. How do we decide who gets 65 and who gets 35? A coin toss? Well, if it's truly coming up with the idea together, um, it depends. Let's take the classic. The classic startup team should have at least a business person and a tech person, whatever the technology is and business. So I'd be in favor of the business person being the CEO, generally speaking. When there's a tech person strong enough with interpersonal skills and the E quotient, the emotional quotient of business, to be both the CTO and the CEO at the same time, that's a unique person. And there's certainly people out there like that. I mean, Bill Gates is an example of somebody who was able to be, you know, a driver on the tech side, but ended up being even more of a business genius and negotiator and ability to get things done as well. So, I mean, if you just take a look at that, that, but it's very rare that somebody's like that. Okay. So let's say (laughs) you recruit me to be your CTO. You're just going to give me 35% out of the gate. Well, if you didn't come up with the idea, you're not the driver. You haven't been there from the, and I'm just looking for a tech person to join my thing. I wouldn't do that. I think the tech, I have a lot of rules on this personally that I tell people. So like with the tech person, at least 10% in a startup, because if you go into single digits, it's almost guaranteed in any kind of hot market or warm market that that person's going to be recruited away for, you know, a eight, ten, twelve thousand dollar a month salary with some small stock options at a better funded or more advanced or you know chronologically advanced company and or a big player, they're gonna steal that person away if they're a competent tech person. And single digits I've just seen is not enough to keep that person. Once you get north of ten percent, then the person's saying, Oh, mm, this startup, I've got over 10%, it could be worth something. Now, if you really want to lock in that tech co-founder and make it right, probably more 20%. So 10 to 20 is the range. Anything 20% or north, a person has a harder time leaving if things are on a good trajectory in any way. And that's what, that's practical experience, what I've seen. So, you know, um, and then you look at what kind of salary you're doing. If they're getting $0, they're probably going to need 20 to 40%, right? Mm -hmm. If they're getting... $2,000 $2,000 a month, um, you know, then maybe they're going to need, you know, 18% example, right? Or, but if you're scratching up and paying them 8,000 a month, then maybe they're down at 10% or 12%. And okay. so you play with those levers. Now, when you decide how much equity to give a, like a co-founder or founding team, I'm assuming a, a vesting schedule is still part of that. Yeah. It's well, first of all, you should never, ever, never, ever, ever, never, never, ever do you any s- kind of startup without founder. Can you vesting. say that one more time. <laughs> yeah. Never, ever, even ever, on ever. founder vesting on yourself, F- founder vesting, uh, even with the, fa- yeah. If you're going to ask your other co-founders to be founder vesting, you should too. I mean, if you leave, you're going to leave them in the lurch too. So why should you leave and keep your equity? So everybody should be subject to founder vesting and it's super smart to do it from day one because if you're eight months into a company and get your first real venture investor, they're going to absolutely 100% require founder vesting. So if you've already got it in place, then they say, good, you've got a year or eight months earned or 12 months earned or 15 months earned. We'll just stick with that. If you're a year into your company and get a real venture investor, they're going to say, just start a four year vesting plan now. So yeah. you're going to, and with a cliff. So okay. they might give you credit for some earned maybe, but a lot of them just say, no, we're going to start four years right now. So that means, you know, and then if they somehow engineer things to have you fired six months later, you're okay. going to be Interesting. losing a lot of equity. Okay. (laughs) How often do investors come and say, we want you to start investing right now again? Is that common? Yes. Yeah. When when you write a check, is that something that you ask the entire team to do? Usually they have founder vesting because they've been mentored or a team that's got their act together. So they would have it in place. So I don't worry about it. Would Podium have had founder vesting? Um, I imagine they would have. I can't imagine they would. Because they were just like a, a... a student team that turned into a billion dollar business. Yeah. But when they first get their first docs from a real venture attorney, they're the venture attorney is going to say you should have founder vesting. Okay. Founder vesting is how you protect founders from one another. Founder vesting is an absolute thing. Now a footnote on founder vesting, just so your okay. listeners know this, if you do founder vesting, it makes your stock restricted. Mm-hmm. And if you have restricted stock, 
the vesting dates become taxable moments. So there's a thing called Rule 83B election, which you can tell the IRS in advance that we're doing founder vesting and my, that makes my stock restricted, but I'm a startup and I want to have an exemption to every vesting date being a taxable event. Mm-hmm. This is really important. And um, the IRS requires you to notify them within 30 days of you getting that stock under a restricted stock plan like founder vesting. And if you miss the 30 days, they never ever forgive anyone and it can cost you millions of dollars in taxes if you're successful. What are your other rules for giving equity to co-founders? Well, you know, just the levers between salary and equity are important and what role they're at. After you're past the true founder stage and have maybe quasi founders coming in, then your the equity percentages start dropping. And if it's just like a key secondary tech person, they're not a even okay. considered a quasi founder, then, you know, you're going to be at, you know, certain percentage, like maybe three, four, five, six, seven percent. And, you know, the play with the numbers based on what kind of salary needs they have. You, it's important to, to, you know, have things be fair. And even if you try to be a policeman and say, nobody should talk about their equity and what grant stock options they got or equity they were granted. Everybody, human nature is they all talk and find out what everybody has anyway. Mm-hmm. So just do it according to good standard patterns in the okay. venture ecosystem and don't do weird stuff and don't try to be secretive and hide things because that causes problems. Okay, so you would have vesting. The CEO should have, in your mind, 65%. What other rules are there? So I think when you start a company, I like to start with 4 million shares total, including an option pool. And the reason okay. is because if you go with only a million shares, that can sometimes be too few. And also the st- share price is higher and not as exciting. People like cheap shares in a startup. So if you go with 4 million shares, you can have cheaper per share price and it just feels like you're getting a better deal. All things being equal, I like to see 15% stock option pools. So that would okay. mean 600,000 in a stock option pool and 3.4 million divided by the founding or the founders in terms of their starting equity. And is that equity given to investors or just? No, no. So in a C Corp, you know, you have authorized shares, okay. but that's not important, right? You just mm-hmm. are telling the government what's the maximum number of shares you can have. But what you issue is what who owns the company. Mm-hmm. And so I'm saying at the beginning, let's issue 3.4 million amongst the founders on whatever okay. percentage you should. And let's add a 600,000 option pool on top of that. Okay. So if it was you and me, there'd be, you would have 65% of the 3.4 million shares. Right. And you would have the other 35%, and then we'd put 600,000 on top of that as well. Now, that means then as you grant those um, shares, and if they become really beneficially owned, that's going to be dilutive to you. But remember, the stock option plan shares that are sitting in there ungranted and unexercised and not owned by anyone don't affect voting until way down the road. Okay. Are there too many, can you have too many co-founders? Yes. How many I, is too many? I think Ten? F- five or more is too okay. many. Yeah. I think the ideal is two, three, or four. Why is that? Um, five just gets to be so many people, and I've never seen a five-person team very deep into a deal where they're all still there. And so you've got the acrimony of ejecting founders and dealing with getting the stock back through the reclaiming of the unvested shares and just... It does, doesn't seem to end well. But having two sometimes is a lot of work for two people. But you can have two f- co-founders then if they get great first team members that are, you know, not founders but really strong and give them good option packages, then it could be great. Cool. Is there anything else you want to add to this topic? Think about just just listen to this because this is of all the things I deal with, in mentoring and helping entrepreneurs, there's nothing worse than the 50-50 problem and the disharmony of messing up this topic. Okay. This is the nightmare situation. Most of the litigation in entrepreneurship is actually around founder suing founder. Mm-hmm. How many uh, of those lawsuits have you seen throughout your career? Countless. More than 100? I don't know, a lot. It's, I don't, not all of them go to lawsuits and filed lawsuits, but as far as legal skirmishes, yes. 
What happens if you find yourself in a legal skirmish with a co-founder? Well, if it's a 50-50 problem, you have to decide and it just seems unresolvable. Sometimes you have to get a little nasty and get a really strong attorney and fire a nuclear bomb at the other side. And a lot of times that'll work. Sometimes it doesn't. It's just a what would be shoot. What, what would be the nuclear bomb? Well, something, whatever in that you got, that's a situationally specific thing. If how it depends on if your paperwork was done right or sloppy and all that type of stuff and what you could do and just get a bulldog situation, you know, that you're nuking your friendship and relationship forever. When you do that, it's not good, Mm -hmm. but that happens. And I've seen people get out of situation doing that. Usually it ends in a negotiation settlement that both sides are unhappy with and then walk away. And it just, anybody that's been through this, it's, It'll take a year plus of your life. It's not. It's not fun. It's a nightmare. It really is the worst of the worst. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, John Richards, for sharing your your advice and topics on how to div- give and divide equity amongst co-founders. Well, thanks for having me, John. Keep doing great work. You're a great asset to the venture community. You've been mentoring hundreds and hundreds of startups for years. So, yeah. and for what is Startup Ignition? Well, um, I've probably mentored in the thousands now, and Startup Ignition is an entrepreneur boot camp in Utah. People from outside the state and outside even the country come to Utah to attend it, and uh, many hundreds have gone through it it's just an intensive short-term boot camp teaching people how to do entrepreneurship right from the start and we'll put a link down here in the bottom so you can see check out startup ignition thank you that's great awesome well thanks and join us next time thank you all right